Give me a vision of many of us who are struggling to make sense of life circumstances. The older that I get, I realize that different people are facing things in different seasons. And those of us who are Christ followers have said yes to a journey of getting to know who God really is. Amen. And there are things in life that we prepare for, and then there are things in life that happen that are simply out of our control, right? How many of us know that we can't control what happens in life, but we can control how we respond? Everybody in this room has been, quote, dealt a hand of cards. I personally don't believe we all start on the same line, if you will. Some people have been dealt setbacks. Some people grew up with horrific childhoods. Some of you have been experiencing an, uh, an insane, hellacious divorce. Others of us have family members who were stricken with cancer and died. Some of us are in a fin financial crisis at one time in our lives. So everybody is always going through something. Is that a fair statement? Right At some point in your life, especially the older that you get, sickness, disease, divorce, death, it's going to come knocking at our door. And as Christ followers, we have been given an opportunity, I want you to listen to me, to refuse to allow death, disease, divorce, disaster, you name it, whatever that you're going through, we have been given an opportunity as Christ followers to not allow our situations and circumstances to put God on trial. It's easy for bad things in life to happen, whether we did them or they were done to us, it's easy for those things to start a war in our minds. Can you say our minds? Satan begins to work on our minds and he begins to help us indict God. He begins to help us put God on trial where now Satan is the leading prosecutor that God is on trial for, and oftentimes we are either the judge or we are the one who has an issue with God. And so I want to talk a little bit this morning about this concept of look again, because many of us who are facing or who will face Difficult circumstances or different difficult situations will be met with a crossroads in our lives. How many of you know there's a difference between questioning God and asking God questions? There's a difference between sticking our finger in the face of God in anger and rage and really our issue is we want to be him. Because if I was God, my wife would have never died of cancer. And if I was God, this and this and this and this would never happen. And so again, we're all walking through something in life that we're facing where we reach a crossroads and we're given this opportunity. Am I going to spend the rest of my life questioning God and really the root is I want to be him? Or can I walk as a son or daughter knowing many things, most things will never even have answers? But Father, it's okay if I ask you questions, but I have to yield to the understanding that even life's hardest questions might not ever be answered in this lifetime. And if all of our 
deepest, darkest questions were answered in this life, we would not need faith. How we doing? Brother, I thought this was a prophetic service. It is. Don't worry. (laughs) Satan's objective has always been to attack our minds. His objective has always been to challenge our thoughts concerning God. If he can in any way partner with us and get us to indict God and put God on trial, he has won. The truth is that the world that we live in is fallen. The truth is that the world that we live in is full of demons. It's full of strongholds. It's full of free will. And there's something on the inside of humanity that longs to be in control, that longs to be God. And as followers of Jesus who are learning how to pick up our cross and follow him, God gives peace and God gives wisdom as we look again and try to find his perspective concerning what we go through. In Daniel chapter 7, Daniel has just come out of the lion's den, a modern-day miracle. Him and a couple of the folks are thrown into a, a live lion's den because they refuse to bow down. The king wakes up early and goes and realizes that Daniel has not been devoured by the lions. And he begins to proclaim that Daniel's God, Yahweh, is Lord. But in Daniel chapter 7, he begins to have this encounter where he sees four demonic beasts that are raging over Babylon. If you pick up in verse 6, he's about to see the, the third one. After this, I kept looking. And behold, another one like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird, the beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it. After this, I kept looking in the night vision. And behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong, And it had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet. And it was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. While I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up from among them, and three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boasts. So again, Daniel is having this encounter. He sees four demonic principalities that are raging over his, the nation that he's living in. And there's this phrase that he keeps saying, I kept looking. I kept looking. When situations and circumstances happen in life, again, Satan's objective is to magnify our pain. Satan's objective is to magnify our warfare. Satan's objective is to magnify my divorce, my pain, my debt, my disease, so that our prayer life is full of telling God how big our giants are rather than telling the giants how big our God is. When you're really going through it, when your prayers are not being answered, when someone is sick, someone is diseased, you're going through a trial in life, I'm pointing out to you that Satan's objective is to tear down who God really is to you. 
He wants to convince you that it's God 50, the devil 50. And we're in some kind of tug of war in this life where we're just uh, some kind of pawn in a play and we'll figure out who wins in the end. A.W. Tozer said, The essence of idolatry is entertaining thoughts about God that are unworthy of Him. The essence of idolatry is entertaining thoughts about God that are unworthy of Him. I can just say as someone in the room this morning, I was thrilled with the worship. The reason why I was thrilled with the worship that happened in this room this morning is because we were a part of a divine collision in the spirit realm that came to make war on thoughts that were unworthy of Jesus. I was, I was sitting there telling Chad, I don't think people really get what's happening. I think some people, they feel the Holy Spirit and God is moving, but we don't recognize that we declared war on the devil for 45 minutes. We told him, we confessed, God, you have no rival. But how mass repentance didn't hit the room is how I know we don't know what we're singing about. You, you couldn't worship this morning and really recognize what was happening and be singing these songs like, God, you have no rival, and not think in my mind any other rival is that which steals my affection and my attention off of Christ. And if there's something in my life that's stealing my affection and my attention, I have to repent of that if I'm going to be a true worshiper. Or what I just did was hypocrisy. I just gave lip service to God and wasn't really serious about walking it out. So Satan breaks into our minds, this is his objective, and he wants us to relate to a God who's on trial, and every little thing that happens in life is another opportunity to put God on trial. You leave the meeting here this afternoon and you hit the road and your tire pops. And all of a sudden you're on the side of 85 and you're out there saying, God, what did I do? Immediately, a little tire pop on the sideway, on the highway, is an opportunity for Satan to break into your mind to indict God because apparently you're so important that God somehow enacted a plan to pop your tire. Oh, boy. People are like, the devil's after me. I'm like, you're not that important. I know that hurts. We're mad at God, or, he, or he, he's mad at us, apparently, that our tire popped. Rather than looking again at the circumstance and saying, well, thank God my tire didn't pop, the car didn't flip, I'm not only dead, but all... Look again. I'd like to talk for a few minutes to some prophets, some prophetic people, some, some feelers. I've been training these types of people for the last 17 years. And here's what I've realized. Most prophets and prophetic people and feelers are trapped in the second heavens. The second heavens involves second heaven warfare. Satan is the prince of the power of the air. We have the first heaven in which we live. You have second heaven warfare. And then you have the third heaven where Christ rules and reigns. 
Some of you are like, Where, where's the heavens? Jesus, our high priest, passed through the heavens, plural. A lot of times what happens is, is prophets or feelers or intercessors, they walk into a region and they sense second heaven warfare. What do I mean? They're just talking about what Satan is doing. They're picking up on second heaven warfare and they're empowering it by prophesying about it. And they're not looking again. I get that the first time that you looked, you saw demonic principalities and powers. I get that you see the problem, but look again and break through to the third heavens and tell me what the solution is. Tell me what God wants to do. Meet feelers and they run into somebody and they're like, ugh. And rather than making an advancement toward that person, identifying the solution to the problem, they back away and call it discernment. I'm a prophet. I'm a li- listen. You know, we we don't. You don't have to parrot Fox News. See, we know America's messed up. But what is the solution? What is God saying about it? What are the strategies and keys that we're giving to the people of God to overcome? We're not prophetic because we see problems and live in the second heavens. We're prophetic because we partner with the heart of God and we tear down strongholds that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God and then we break through with Jesus and tear open atmospheres so that heaven can come down. It's right here. Daniel just comes out of the lion's den and boom, he's hit with this fourfold demonic principalities and powers raging over Babylon and he's saying, and I looked again, and I looked again. Folks, he looks four times, but here comes the fifth time. Get ready, verse nine. I kept looking until thrones were set up and the ancient of days took his seat. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat, and the books were opened. Then I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, but an extension of life was granted to them for an appointed time. If, if, if Daniel prophetically short circuits, which happens to a lot of prophets and prophetic people and feelers, they never look beyond the demonic realm. They end up backing away from darkness rather than stepping into the authority that we've been given in Christ Jesus. Daniel keeps looking And all of a sudden, the heavens are opened. And he sees the Ancient of Days sitting upon his throne. And again, just just get giddy with me a little bit. We're still in the Old Covenant, guys. Daniel the prophet, in an inferior covenant, is having a vision of Father God on the throne, the Ancient of Days. He's seeing the Godhead. Sorry to our oneness Pentecostal brethren. He's seeing the Godhead, the Ancient of Days, sitting upon his throne, having dominion. Look at this. He's not satisfied with that 13. I kept looking 
end of the night visions and behold with the clouds of heaven one light now he's not just seen the father the ancient of days now he's seeing Jesus Christ the son of man he's coming and he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him and to him was given dominion glory and a kingdom that all the peoples nations men of every language might serve him his dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. As for me, Daniel, my spirit was distressed within me. And the visions in my mind kept alarming me. Go to verse 21. What's it say? I don't know what you're facing this morning. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what your questions are. I don't know where your anger and rage level is. But God is saying to a people this morning, keep looking. Keep looking. Has Satan infiltrated your mind? Have you partnered with him where now God is on trial and we're the judge? And we're waiting for God to say sorry for something he had nothing to do with? I'm not trying to demean or trying to lower the level of the pain and the heartbrokenness and the reality that some of us come from. But I know that Satan wants to paralyze us. Sometimes why is an invalid question that makes us an invalid? When you deal with people that have been through traumatic events, when you deal with people who are going through mental health crisis, Many times their current behavior is an indicator of when the trauma began. You're talking to someone who's 48 years old who's acting 12. Why? Because at the age of 12, the trauma began that sought to paralyze their emotions, sought to paralyze their behavior, and they're trapped and unable to get free unless they look again. Look, I get that it's easier just to sweep everything under the rug. I get that it's easier just to allow a dysfunctional marriage to carry on until the kids get out of the house rather than declare war on the devil and serve him notice. I'm not giving you any more space in my mind. I will not allow you to lie to me about who my father is. I will not allow you to question God's goodness anymore. I will, I'm not going to continue to wake up every day and allow all the bad things that happen to me in life as some kind of indicator about whether God loves me or not. Jesus is king, period. God is good, period. Jesus is judge, period. Jesus is our intercessor, period. But again, our ability to hold fast to that period is what gets tested in all of life. Because there are just things in life that happen that we have absolutely no control over. And in the days of our greatest shaking, we always go back to who we really know God to be. I was doing Bible study with my son Israel. We finally had a free weekend this weekend, so my wife took the girls and had a girls weekend, and I took our son Israel and had a guys weekend. And we had some fun and did some things, and then I had about an hour with him down on the floor walking through Matthew 16. And I was saying to him, son, you're growing up as a ministry kid, and Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? Who does mom or dad, who does the preacher? But then Jesus asked them, who do you say that I am? 
And I said, son, the most important thing about you that will define your life is who you say God is. I don't care how much religious activity you do, how many fasts, how much money you give, how many prayer meetings you attend. The most important thing about you is your revelation of who God is. And it's somehow, some way in our revelation of who God is that gets tested in seasons of devastation in unforeseen circumstances, when things pop up that we did not expect, are we going to blame God? Are we going to accuse him? Are we going to allow Satan to entice us that really we want to be God? There's something in walking in relationship with Jesus that goes something like this. I believe that God is good. I believe that Jesus is king. I believe he's judge. I believe he's my intercessor. He's praying for me. But when my ability to reason and my ability to understand what's happening runs out, I have to choose to bow my knee to the Father as a creature and not the creator and say, Father, you know best. This is the essence of the gospel. Lord, I choose to follow you, though none go with me. Jesus, I choose to follow you. If death and disease strike my family and everybody dies, I refuse to put you on trial. A lot of people talk to me about sickness and disease. I've been in hospital rooms where we've prayed and the sick have recovered and I've been in hospital rooms where the sick never recovered and the family goes ballistic and starts shouting at you as the preacher because a lot of people that are mad at God, I hate to tell you, they're mad at preachers. You're his representative, so if I can't get to God, I'll get to you and give you everything you don't want. Screaming, yelling, shouting, how could God there's no answers that you can give people in their darkest hour of pain that will ever meet those questions that are boiling on the inside of them but here's what I know I can love here's what I know I can be there Here's what I know. I can keep looking again and saying, God, I refuse to believe that you're not somewhere in the midst of even deep darkness and pain. Lord, I have to believe that somehow, some way, even though I will never believe that you're the author of it, I believe because you're God, you're going to show me something through this that can help me on my journey. Is it God's will to heal? Of course it is, but it's also God's choice to heal. Uh Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Is it God's will to heal? Absolutely. But as God, is it his choice to heal? Absolutely. And just because I don't understand why he chooses to heal some and not others, doesn't mean that I'm going to forsake God. Folks, I'm telling you, I've prayed for thousands of people. Many of them healed, many of them not healed. It's never deterred my faith. Because my faith is not in faith, my faith is in God. And I pray the prayers of faith and believe that the sick will recover But if they don't recover in the timing or the way that I believe they should, I take a knee and say, Father, you know best. My ability to reason, my ability, it's run out, but I'm not going to put you on trial. Daniel looked again. and He saw the Ancient of Days and then he sees the Son of Man. And he's breaking through again. I want to help some of us. You've got to break through the warfare. You've got to understand the tactics of the devil is to magnify the problem. 
He wants to literally steal any space you'll give him in your prayer life where you're not praying from the place of faith, you're praying from the place of fear. I think about 90% of prophetic words I'm reading online right now are inspired by fear. I think a lot of people are going through PTSD about 2020. I think they're projecting it into 2024 and the internet is full of all of the bad stuff that's about to hit planet earth and apparently no one's broken through the second heavens to tell us what God's going to do this year. I want you to guard your mouth, guard your speech, guard what you're talking about. Is my prayer time full of prophetic declaration and solution about what God's about to do or have I become fascinated? Why is it in charismania that we have a revelation on any kind of evil spirit that half of them aren't even in the Bible? It sells, it draws people. We have more revelation on the demonic realm than we have revelation of Christ Jesus and his kingdom and his authority, by the way, that knows no end. And he was given all power and all authority and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And by the way, through his blood, you're seated with him in heavenly places and whatever he binds on earth we bind and what is God saying this year come up higher look again yes feel the swirl I, we gotta have my we gotta have this we gotta have that look again What's God after? What, I mean, I got a calling, brother. I'm just ready for the door. If the door's not opening, you're still in school. Stop acting like a prima donna who deserves a microphone and recognize you have an issue with God. Your issue is with his timing. Your issue is with why is he allowing other people to go in front of me? You're in school. This is not about other people. This is about God's plan for your life that looks different than other people's lives. Look again. There's going to be a people emerge in the earth who are like Caleb with a different spirit. And it's going to be very easy for them to echo and parrot what everybody else is talking about, about how demonic it is and how evil everybody is and whatever. But rather than continue to parrot and mimic how bad the world is getting and how evil people are getting, they're going to look again and they're going to see Christ on the throne in the midst of evil ruling and reigning. They're going to understand that Christ not only has the victory and has authority, but he has given us power. He has given us authority. He has given us his armor to stand, not to lay down, but to stand. I feel like the Lord is saying to some of you, you've already starting out this year laying down, and I came to tell you this morning, it's time to stand up. Some of us have already given space to the enemy to torment our minds and this morning it's time to serve him notice you're not doing this in 2024 I am not a victim I am a victor in Christ Jesus I will not allow my circumstances I will not allow my family upbringing to determine my future Satan you're a liar you're a deceiver I'm not going to be paralyzed into the past 
I'm going to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Jesus. Lord, I'm not going to allow the sickness that took out a family member to trap me into angry with you for the rest of my life. I'm going to say, Father, I'm upset. Father, I don't understand, but I'm going to leave it to you in the end to know whatever happened. Lord, I'm I'm got to believe that what I went through and the faith that I still have can empower someone else in the midst of their struggle. I'm not going to let the enemy get a victory in this. I'm not going to allow him to lie to me. I'm going to actually allow Satan and his little small battles that he wins, I'm going to allow it to empower me to live the rest of my life making sure he never wins a battle again. But folks, it starts in your mind. It starts in your mind. God is good. Jesus is king. Jesus is the judge. Anytime Satan comes and tries to... So turn to Hebrews chapter 12 and we'll we'll land the plane. Am I helping anybody? I'm telling you, there's a prophetic rumble in this room. God is saying to many people in this room, look again. You need fresh vision. You are empowering demons and destruction in your life because your speech is full of negativity. God is trying to upgrade and mature feelers in this room, prophetic people in this room. You've got to grow in maturity. You've got to look again past what you feel and ask God to give you solutions. Ask God to give you strategy. Ask God to give you breakthrough in people's lives. Hebrews 12, therefore... Since we have such a great cloud of witnesses. How many of you heard teachings on the cloud of witness? So we're coming out of Hebrews 11, the the Hall of Fame chapter, all the heroes of the faith who, by the way, didn't have an easy American life. They went through tragedy and, and believed by faith that God was good, that Jesus was coming The cloud of witnesses, uh, some translations say the cloud of pioneers, the cloud of victors, the cloud of martyrs. Let us also lay aside every distraction and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Fixing our eyes on my problems. I'm telling you, I'm just going to say it one time. There was something special that happened in this room this morning that needs to keep happening. There was something called real biblical worship that happened in this room this morning that exalted the greatness of God and as we exalt his greatness, it tears down demonic ideologies concerning who God is. This was not typical entertainment worship about me, me, me and my, my, my and whoa, whoa, whoa and ho, ho, ho. There was something of a heavenly anointing and authority that was here that tears down demonic torment. More of it. Not just on Sunday. You need some this afternoon. Folks, anybody have a job tomorrow where you're like, brother, second heaven, and that's like my, my work address. I, I live in the demonic principal, Satan's, uh, yeah. But if you don't put your armor on, if you don't recognize the strategies of the devil, if you don't get ready for the moment something doesn't go your way, I'm already ready. 
The moment something doesn't go my way, I'm the first one, God's good. The moment tragedy strikes, Jesus is king. The moment something happens, God's the judge. We've got to get on the offensive. We've got to look again. We've got to ask for divine perspective. We've got to ask Jesus what you're doing in the midst of it. We've got to sure up our knowledge and understanding of the God of the Bible and make sure we're not buying in to the God of the imagination that the American church is selling to millions, sending them to hell. God is glorious. God is great. Folks, what's true preaching? What's true prophecy? Let me tell you something. True prophetic preaching confronts vain imaginations concerning God, who God is. True prophetic preaching is not lollipops and candy telling you what God has for your life. Real messengers are drunk on the knowledge of God. Oh, I thank God for Madison and the bird. I just wanted to go up and just start hugging him during the worship. Thank you. Thank you for facilitating an atmosphere where people can get delivered, where we can repent, where we can get set free. Thank you for an opportunity to look again and say, oh my gosh, Lord, I see you. You're high and lifted up and the train of your robe is filling Canopolis. And even as darkness is spreading across America, I see glory. I hear the words of Jesus. The gates of hell will not prevail. The gates of hell will not prevail in my marriage, will not prevail in my family. Satan, I'm not going to give you the victory any longer. Well, I'll just believe in God once my prayer request gets answered. You're already partnering with the devil by postponing your joy. It's not the Bible I read. Well, when this happens and when... And again, folks, just to take you there, because I think a lot of people need to go there. And what if it never happens? I prayed. I sought the Lord. I have 50 prophetic words, and it never happened. God's good. Jesus is king. And Lord, just because I don't understand how it all worked out doesn't mean I'm going to put you on trial. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Brother, I need a word. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Is it a house? Is it a car? Is it more money? Fix your eyes on Jesus. The author and the perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him, lived his best life now. I, I, I truly do believe that a false gospel the prosperity gospel that's been preached in America for decades has set people up to indict a God that they should be loving and serving if they were just told the truth. If it doesn't work in China, stop preaching it. Any gospel that cannot cross cultural boundaries is not an eternal gospel. That, you know, the televangelist, come to Jesus and you'll never have another problem again. It's really not funny, though. Do you know how many people sat in a recliner and said, oh, man, my life is 
difficult and yeah, of course I want Christ. No problems again. They say a prayer and send in a, you know, $9.99 for whatever they're selling, oil or prayer cloths or whatever. And then a problem happens and they realize, and here, here's the best, rather than knowing the preacher lied, they're mad at God. Like, brother, you were introduced to a God of someone's imagination. The scriptures don't promise a jail-free card out of fire, but it does promise he'll go with us through the fire. This, are you hearing? Are you hearing me? Are you, are you hearing this, folks? We're, we're living in, in shaking. Obviously, we're living in demonic. We're living in this. This, but we have, with everything that we have, we have to get rock solid on our knowledge of God, our revelation of who He is. We cannot forsake Him in an hour of crisis because somewhere along our journey we were lied to about who God really is. We have to go back and search through the pain, the agony, the divorce, the disease, the death of a loved one and say, Lord, if there's anywhere in me that has you on trial, if there's anywhere in me that's waiting for you to repent, I release you today. And Satan, let me, let me tell a story and we'll close. Many of you know that I have a brother who was arrested some years ago and he's serving a long-term prison sentence in a federal prison. And I had walked with him on a journey talking to him about there's a difference between knowing God and knowing about God. And you can sing songs and quote scriptures, but unless you get rooted in experiential knowledge of who God is, the moment crisis hits, you'll turn on God. Through a series of events, he ends up getting locked up, and I had a sense he was going to spend a number of years in prison. I told my wife, Morgan, I said, honey, I just need like an hour just to process what's happening. I go into my closet and I begin to let out a tongue that I've never spoken in up to that point and I've never spoken after. People speak in tongues, but I'm telling you there are many tongues and many variations of tongues. And if you've been around tongue talkers long enough and you take praying in the Spirit seriously, there are different manifestations of the Holy Spirit that will come at times even through tongues. I'm helping somebody. But I go in my closet and I begin to weep. And I begin to cry out in what I would call as warfare tongues. I had no English. Sometimes the devil breaks in. Sometimes you're going through hell. And it, it, I don't even have words for it. That was that kind of season I was in. And I remember when the burden finally left and I was ready to talk in English, I didn't say anything to God. I spoke first to the devil. I said, Satan, you might have locked up one Samuel, my brother's name, but before he gets out, I'm going to raise up 10,000 Samuels in the earth. In a dark closet, snotting and crying, I took my... I feel the Holy Ghost, man. <sighs> I took my stand in private. I, I wrestled 
with my own anger about so many things. And I turned my energy. I turn, I tell people they think I'm weird. I hate the devil just as much as I love Jesus. Some of you, because you haven't traveled on the road, you know, like we travel, talking about you preach 10 times in two days and you're like whacked out of your mind. No, preaching's fun. I'm like, I'm laying in my bed and I'm just like, God, I'm exhausted beyond measure. And I sense a love for Jesus, but I also sense a hatred for the devil. And I say, God, if I could just get one more Samuel, I'll get up out of this bed and I'll go to that church and I'll preach the uncompromising gospel of Jesus Christ. And I will make the devil pay for every thought he had of destroying my family. And every day that I rise, I tell him God is good. And I refuse to lay down and give up. That there was something that I settled. I, I feel strongly the Lord is saying to people here, I brought you here today so that you could settle this. I don't know what your this is. We're going to have an altar call today. And whatever this is, Whatever that, that, that blow, that, that card, that divorce, that death, that, that it might be right now. You're going through it and saying, Lord, I'm going to take a stand today and say you're good. And I'm going to look again and turn this thing on its head. And rather becoming a victim of my circumstance... Rather than just giving up and letting the devil win, I'm going to set a trajectory for 2024 to make the devil pay. When we win it in private, then the anointing comes public. And folks, I, I, love, I love the church. I love the services. I, I grew up a PK but there are many, many things about faith that will never be accomplished corporately. The, the kid's pastor, I love Joyce. She's like as pure and as good as you could hire, but she cannot parent your kids. And if you will not wrestle with their will, and if you will not fight to disciple them, she can only do so much. There are things that we have to win privately in our home, in the prayer closet, to get resolve and to get rock solid on who God is and then turn all the forces of our, our, our fire on the enemy. Satan, I know you're going to pay when he comes again, but I'd sure like to make you pay now. Oh, folks, I, I, you know, you, you talk about, I'll, I'll stop because I'm going to keep preaching, but there's just, I know I like have that warrior thing in me. You're like, man, why is this guy? It's because I've allowed the Lord to create a cavity in me. That when the devil came and damaged me, Rather than turn on God, I said, God, fill that wound with your glory. Amen. Generation is suicidal. They're abused. They're, it's all around us. What are we going to do about it? couldn't just be a voice in America and shout about all the evil. I had to buy a piece of land called Camp Goshen. Do you understand what I'm saying? Camp Goshen is not just, it's to make the devil pay. <laughs> it's for every foot that walks on that property.
Why do I give my finances to make the devil pay? It's in the grocery store at Food Lion. The lady behind me is on food stamps. I don't pity her. I just look at her and say, I'd love to make the devil pay right now. It has nothing to do with she can't pay her groceries. I want to destroy every poverty devil in her life. So I just quickly buy her and don't even think about it. But again, it's a mindset. It's an authority. It's a power. Wherever the devil is raging, it's prophesying about what God wants to do. I move in an opposite spirit. Where there's heaviness, I invoke praise. Where there's depression, I pray in the Holy Ghost till they get free. I'm actively looking for ways to destroy the works of the devil. God is saying to us this morning, can you settle this? I spoke about my brother. I could speak about many other things. But he's trying to set your course in 2024. He wants to invite you, allow me into that disease, into that death, into that divorce, into that. Bring it to me. I want to open up this altar. If you know the Lord speaking to you, come right now. Quickly, you, you already know. Holy Spirit's been mightily upon you the whole service. This is just not a moment. This is momentum. I'm prophesying to some of you, this is not just, this choice today is not just a moment. This is momentum. This is fresh wind. This is the Spirit of God blowing behind you and going to get you where you need to go this year. If you're sitting, would you begin to pray in the Holy Spirit? Let's just begin to stir up this atmosphere. Come on, I want you to begin to open up your mouth. Come on, saints, I need you to begin to help me to begin to take our stand against the fiery darts of the evil one. We begin to guard ourselves with the shield of faith, with the belt of truth, with the breastplate of righteousness. Come on, if you know the word, begin to speak the word. We begin to tear down and take captive demonic thoughts in our minds concerning who God is. We just declare that the Weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Satan, we serve you notice today that you are banned from this place. In the name of Jesus, I command every tormenting spirit to leave your mind right now in Jesus' name. Every demonic spirit of accusation, I sever you at your root and I say Jesus is king. Jesus is king. All over this place, I want you to begin to say Jesus is king. Where there's a king, there's a kingdom. Every demon must bow. Jesus is king. 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 king. Every spirit of anger, go. Every rebellious spirit, go. Every spirit of insomnia, I take authority over you in the name of Jesus. And I command you to leave. Come on, just two more minutes. Two more minutes. 
Come on, I want you to pray and just invite Jesus in. Jesus, I proclaim you as king. Jesus, I release this to you. Come on, it's time to break through the second heavens. I'm talking to some feelers. I'm talking to some prophets and prophetic people. It's time to break through the warfare and begin to learn how to rule and reign with Christ, how to prophesy from heavenly places. Ha! Come on, we're going to begin to prophesy from a different place. We're going to begin to pray from a different place. We're going to begin to parent from a different place. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. I see him picking many of you up. A fresh wind is coming. A different perspective is coming. Holy Spirit, come and get the glory. Lord, let their death not be in vain. And I just command the spirit of witchcraft to be broken off of your life right now. There is an intimidating, there is a bullying spirit in this room. And I break every threat of the devil. I cancel every contract in the spirit realm. And I break it over your life in the name of Jesus. Every hex, every vex, every word curse. I command it to be broken off of your life in Jesus' name. I command every spirit of free masonry to be broken right now in Jesus' name. Every spirit of free masonry in your bloodline I command it to be broken right now in Jesus name come on come up higher says the Lord come up higher says the Lord let me show you what must take place next. Come on, his glory is going to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Your family is marked for revival. Every spirit of divorce, I command you to leave this place right now in Jesus' name. I thank you for marriage reconciliation. I thank you for marriage revival. Holy Spirit, fall this week in Jesus' name. We prophesy over our children, Isaiah 8.18, that they are signs to this generation.